Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. We thank you for joining us. This week we are joined by retired Lieutenant General Russell Honoré. Remember, we take your questions each episode, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, and don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check out the link to this week's sponsors, Chili Technology, Rise, and Magic Spoon in the show notes. We thank you for supporting the sponsors. It makes this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, James, once again, lots to talk about. Uh, Really telling elections in Ohio to start. Uh, Once again, a mainstream progressive, Chantel Brown, defeated a left-winger in a special election for a House seat in the Cleveland to Akron area. You, You know, this continues a pattern. New York City, Virginia, Louisiana, 21, and the presidential elections last year. The Democratic left, when it comes to elections, really is a paper tiger. They have a big megaphone. They attract media attention and a big Twitter following. They don't attract votes, however. Uh, And the House, for all the attention the squad gets, they comprise less than 5% of that caucus, and it wasn't increased in that special election in Ohio. And just quickly, in the Republican side, a coal lobbyist in a separate congressional district, actively backed by Donald Trump, clobbered some state legislators. Democrats, I think, don't want Trump to go away electorally. Some of his candidates may be real liabilities in a general election. What do you think? Uh, yeah, ask Glenn Youngkin in Virginia. Yeah. All right, I, I, he's going to deal with it. I mean, if the point that you make is exactly the correct. This actually was a good piece in the New York Times of Alexander Byrne this morning, a very good reporter, yep. and who goes through what's happened recently. And these people are, are like, they just, they never give up. They, they keep getting beat and they keep making excuses. You know, and, and the lines were very, very well drawn. I mean, AOC went in there and said, send, you know, Nina Turner to Washington for me. And I thought it was a pretty arrogant message, but that's all right. And they got beat, and they got beat by almost six points. And they started with a 35-point lead. In hard money, they outspent massive, more hard money was spent on behalf of, of Nina Turner than was for Chantel Brown. And, and then Nina Turner on election night makes it like out-of-state money came in and bought the election away from her. I, it, it, I, I'm not, I can't say for sure, but it had a whiff of anti-Semitism to it, I'll tell you that. Well, uh, I think what what happens, um, I think the left can, the small left, can sometimes be useful as a pressure point. I mean, AOC and Cori Bush drove home the need to do something about rental evictions this week. They raised a legitimate issue, whatever you think the, uh, the result is. But when they dominate the dialogue, talk about defunding the police, get rid of ICE, July 4th is a tainted uh, holiday, it then in, infects other Democrats. That's the problem. And I also think the biggest culprit here is the media. They have such a big megaphone. I mean, if if you were to talk to the House, you were to talk about um, uh, uh, Rashida Tlaib from Detroit and Mikey Sherrill from New Jersey, every member, every Democratic member virtually would say Sherrill's a much more important member, but the squad member from Detroit gets a lot more attention. The media ought to focus on who matters. Yeah, and what they don't do, they they can't win an election in a place that's under D plus 30, all right? That's all they can do is make noise. They have no electoral clout outside of where you have a a number of young inner city voters, and that's it. And they're not an equal partner in the Democratic governing coalition. They're certainly part of the coalition, but are not a particularly big part of the coalition. And the problem is, is they deliver 10 percent of the votes and 70 percent of the noise. Yeah, at least 70 percent. And yeah. and that district in Ohio was probably plus 30, more than plus 30. Oh, yeah, uh, and they geez. and they and they didn't win there either. Couldn't uh, win a primary. All right. So what do you think about uh, Trump's guy winning big? Well, I, I think that the Texas was a little overinterpreted as kind of bad news of Trump because remember Democrats, the, the, the 
the in person that, that Trump endorsed, I, I, I don't hadn't done the math, but I'm almost positive, got a majority of the Republican votes. But so it, it's a, it, and I do think Trump is losing a little bit of his clout. But boy, he, he showed what he had in the Republican Party in Ohio, and you know we got a, we got a shot there. We got you a did. shot. Yeah, you'd rather run against a uh, a coal lobbyist. Uh, in this environment than you would uh, run against uh, a state legislator. And by the way, there is a huge scandal uh, in the state of Ohio, mainly uh, driven by Republicans, and it involves uh, a lot of those lobbyists. I don't think it's a good year to run as a lobbyist in uh, in Ohio. And it's a tough district. Trump carried it by 14. It's the kind of Columbus suburbs and small towns. But you're right. It was a shot. And I think if one of those others had won, it probably wouldn't have been a shot. Right. I think that's I think that's the feeling on the ground in Ohio, too. It, yeah. it, it couldn't be setting, you know, whether we can do it or not is a, is a question, but it can't set up any better for us. Absolutely. I think what we would say. Yep. James, moving uh, about 500 miles away to the state of New York, the report from the New York Attorney General's office about Andrew Cuomo was devastating. It unequivocally stated that he sexually harassed 11 women. They talked to 179 people. Most of those women worked for him, including a state trooper. The investigation was conducted really by a couple of highly regarded outsiders. You know, a couple weeks ago, I wrote that if Cuomo escaped uh, any criminal charges, he might well win re he might well win re-election. I thought the field was so barren in New York. Not now. This report was far worse than anyone anticipated. He could even be indicted now, uh, but he is a goner. He has no personal safety net. Uh, he, he's, he's gotten a lot done as governor. I mean, he has to be given credit for that, but he's tough, but he's a bully. And State Senator Al- Alessandra Biagi, who worked for Cuomo for a while, said, and I quote, she told the New York Times this, I have never met anyone in New York politics who has a good relationship with Andrew Cuomo. When you're in trouble, you need friends, friends who really care about you. I don't think even that could surmount this trouble, but Andrew Cuomo has no friends. He's a goner. Yeah, but I, 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 he's a goner, but they're going to have to pull him out of there with a winch truck because I don't think he's going to leave under his own power. Yeah. I don't think he's got a place to live. But he, he doesn't strike me as the kind of guy that's going to resign for the good of the party or the good of the state. I mean, it, it's going to be a, you know, I. If he, it, it, I don't see how he makes it. And that report, he asked for that report, by the way. Right. And the people that did it, it seemed to me, from a distance, were pretty thorough. Yeah, and, and pretty they, objective. And they did interview him for hours, and they eleven hours. They basically said they didn't believe him, uh, and that's pretty devastating. You're right. Uh, he doesn't want to leave, but he faces, I think, both the possibility of indictments by several local DAs and. Uh, he faces, I think, almost the probability of impeachment now. As you know, one the one core support he had left was among some of the more prominent black politicians, like Hakeem Jeffries, the congressman from New York City. They've left him now. Uh, so uh, I think when the hand rains in the wall, it's not any better for the state of New York. It's not any better for politics. It's a hell of a lot better for Andrew Cuomo which at some point he may realize if he resigns. Yeah, I don't think he sees it that way. <laughs> but, you know, I don't he, think sure, he does it all. He sure doesn't today, but, uh, no. uh, you know, a couple more bad days like this, you know, it, it may be uh, it may be eye-catching for him. Right. Um, I mean, it's... Go ahead. I don't know. I, I, I think we've exhausted the subject. <laughs> well, I know. I, I, I wish I could think of an upper, but uh, I'm afraid I have one that's anything but, and that's COVID. And a few weeks ago, I think we both thought we were headed back to normal. We thought, God, it's about time. We just hate this. I think Delta has changed that. Donald McNeil, the superb medical and science reporter who was at the New York Times, wrote a really good column this week that said the Biden administration has to move more aggressively. Vaccine mandates, vaccine passports, penalty for those who deny. This will be very difficult short-term politics, no question. But if this variant or a new one takes off and instead of 600,000, we have 800,000 or a million Americans die, the long term politics for the economy and the social fabric of this country will be far worse. We're in a really critical time in the next couple of weeks, James. 
Well, tell me. I mean, if you know, we got General Henry on today, so we're probably going to talk about the, the catastrophic events that are taking place in Louisiana. And I mean, mm-hmm. I say catastrophic. I mean, they're having like fly doctors in. They're completely out of beds in ICU units. The, the, this woman, Catherine O'Neill, who is the chief medical officer at the largest hospital in Louisiana, it's in Baton Rouge, Out Lady Lake, went on television and says, we're not, we're not providing, uh, we're providing substandard care for everybody. She said, we got people with chest pains with, that, you know, with, with family members out in waiting rooms and we can't tell them anything. I, I, I mean, I, these people are so, I, 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 they're so goddamn stupid. I don't know what to do. I feel like just going in a, in a screaming match. And what are you talking about? You know, we're going to lose more people to this virus than we lost in World War II. I, I mean, what, what basically, these anti-vaxxers are, you know, are, are feeding talking points to Tokyo Rose. Or Axis Sally, or whoever they had back there, they actually trade us to the United States. Well, what, what a, this is a, a national public health emergency of the first order. And I'm, I'm a little bit with, you know, Donald McNeil. I, uh, you know, they got to step up here. I, the, the LSU said that you, 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 know, you don't have to be vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, just be tested once a month. What is that? Where did they come up with that? Now, and I'm a big admirer of the, the, the new president and everything, but I don't know what's going through people's minds. They better start treating this like what it is, is a public health catastrophe. Yeah. That Until is, somebody does, this shit's going to be around. You're right. That is totally inadequate. You know, the Israeli study, which looks like a pretty good one, suggests that after about six months, the effectiveness of the vaccine diminish. I think that's likely. We have a miracle vaccine. The one right. thing, the one thing America has right. done better than anyone in the world, we have created these miracle vaccines. We ought to intensify production, push people to get booster shots, vaccinate younger children. Uh, I mean, breakthrough infections, it's true. You don't get as sick and you're very unlikely to die, but there are consequences to that. And I, I think the Biden administration has to be much more aggressive. I, I think they've done a you know pretty good job so far, but, but no one anticipated this or few did. And now is the time to really put, uh, you know, uh, your they got to do something. Like the, I mean, the, and it's it's really somebody sent me a chart. Unsurprisingly, that the rate of hospitalization by state almost perfectly tracks the rate of vaccination. Yeah, and I'm going to ask all my colleagues in the media. I'm in the media bashing day today, James. Take a look at Ron DeSantis's real record in Florida. I think over 20 percent of the new cases are occurring in the state of Florida where he has claimed that he has, he has beaten the scientists. He has done a great job. Florida is a disaster. And uh, I would encourage everyone in the media to look at that and report on that. Oh, God, is it a disaster? And, you know, I've never seen fortunes turn so fast as they're turning on DeSantis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, now everybody has figured it out. And he is cracking under the pressure. I mean, I watch his press conference, and he's lashing out at the press. He, he, you know, everything that happens when you're under enormous pressure, as he justifiably is, he, he's not handling it well. Yeah. He's not handling it well. Hard to handle and, well, isn't it, James, when your record is abysmal failure and people are dying all around you? But Yes, and it's hard to handle well when everybody told you what was going to happen if you did what you did. And, of course, that's what's happening. It's happening left and right. And it's, well, it's summer, you know, every kind of excuse you can. Again, you just got to look at hospitalizations and vaccinations. It, 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 it ain't hard. And, you know, his political posturing, I can't believe, you and I have talked about this before, I can't believe how parts of the national media became almost in a trance about how DeSantis was so strong politically. I, 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 I don't fear, I don't fear it out. And I'm going to tell you, you know, there's it, not going to be a great environment for Republicans in Florida in 2022, I don't think. No, I think, it, nor should it be. And um, I, um, I agree with you. The media, there was just all kinds of these puff pieces that uh, he's riding high. Just look at the data. Just look at the data. Look at the cases per capita, look at the deaths per capita, and compare Florida to most other states, and they do they do abysmally. So, mm-hmm. 
Okay, well, next week, I prom- first of all of our listeners out there, I'm convinced that if you listen to this podcast, you've been vaccinated. Uh, if yeah. any of you haven't, please get vaccinated. But you probably know people who haven't. And prod them, encourage them, uh, pressure them, whatever it takes. I, 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 I'm, I know some people that are unvaccinated, and I, I'm, I'm scared to talk to them. And they say, that's the last thing you want to do is like, you know, tell them they're stupid. Well, you're stupid. Okay. Yeah, they what are. else can I tell you? They're stupid. Promise next week we'll have something upbeat. Although actually right. the, the special election in Ohio was upbeat. And that was a good story. Okay. And I mean, right. some, some, of, some of these Olympic performances have been pretty good. You know. Hey, hey, I want to tell you, I watched the, the women's 400 meter hurdles the other night. It was one, and I just, it was accidentally, because by and large, I, I, it goes, I go crazy. I don't know what's on, when it's on. I miss things. Uh, I'm not very impressed with NBC's coverage, but that women's 400 meters hurdle was one of the great races I've ever seen in my life. That 21 year old woman from New Jersey and her close teammate, 31 year old gold medal. Uh, a defending champion went down. I mean, literally, they cleared the last hurdle tied. It was an amazing race. It, it was. It, the, by the way, the men's 400 was unbelievable, too. We came in second half, like a Norwegian guy uh, came in first. And I mean, it, it, it was the same thing. It was a, that, that's one of the most thrilling events at the Olympics, I think. It really is. I mean, to a, first of all, the idea, I mean, you and I could, would have. You, you know, trouble oh. tr- trouble running the hundred in uh, fifty one seconds, much less a oh. four a four hundred while you're you know jumping over a dozen hurdles. It's amazing. Right. Hey, they, I ran I ran a quarter mile in high school, and with the time they these athletes are putting up, are just like they're just they're stunning. And, and they you know? do it so seamlessly. It really is amazing. So the only thing I'll, I'll say is I actually met Edwin Moses on an airplane one time. He was probably the most dominant athlete in a, in a given event in the history of the world. <laughs> I mean, I, I think he went like seven, eight years out of losing a race. And he revolutionized it. He used to, used to take, I forgot what it was, like 13 steps between the hurdles, and now he, you know, he cut it back to 11. And you talk about hard. When you cut that last hurdle, whoo, I can't imagine how oxygen deprivation you have. Well, I'll tell you, uh, you're absolutely right. And, and, and that woman, Ms. Mc, what is it, Sydney McFarland, I think. Was it McFarland? God, is she good. Yeah, she yeah. is good. Anyway, it was great. Okay. Next week, we'll have some more upbeat stuff. Hey, James, if you look at the science, the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep is by lowering core body temperature. It really is, you'd be amazed. Temperature controlled sleep restores testosterone levels, repairs muscle after a hard day's work, and improves cognitive function, so you always start your day feeling sharp and alert. But you know, sleeping cool really is good for everyone, right, James? Yeah, I, you know what, one of the things, you know, how many times when you sleep, you turn the pillow over because it's cooler on the other side? This is an amazing product. Because your body actually likes that. And again, I, I'll say this to anybody. To, to me and to most people I know, the most determinative event in how they feel is how they, today is how they slept last night. All right. That, that, I know for me, that is, that is the number one factor. If I, didn't, if I didn't sleep well at night, I don't have it. This product, it, it, I don't know why somebody didn't think of this before. Because it, 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 it's brilliant. And, and that's right. It is. It is. This fabulous product is Chili Sleep, and Chili Sleep makes customized climate controlled sleep solutions that help you improve your entire well being. It makes the cooler and cube sleep systems, hydro powered, temperature controlled mattress toppers that fit over your existing mattress to provide you ideal sleep temperature. These luxury mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep sleep, whether you're sleep hot or cold. These sleep systems are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. Imagine waking up and not feeling tired. Oh, I love that thought, James. Chili sleep can help make that happen, and it does make that happen. And then for an extra layer of comfort, they also make the chili blanket, the only weighted blanket that can also be compared with a control unit for the ultimate sweat-free sleep. 
James, you like sweat free sleep. I, I, I do, and I like a good night's sleep. And the only thing that actually, like, I can't believe I didn't think of this. Or if somebody didn't think of this before. It's just so evident. And, you know, it's just it goes to show you how, you know, creative people are. And sometimes the solution is just right under our nose. And the fact that these people thought this up and brought it to market, it, you know, it, it, the only thing that amazes me is that, you know, we didn't have it before because it makes so much sense. I mean, real sense. And it sure does. So head over to chillysleep.com slash war room to learn more and check out a special offer available exclusively for politics war room listeners and only for a limited time. That's chili, C H I L I, sleep.com slash war room to take advantage of our exclusive discount and wake up refreshed every day. Also, look for the link in our show notes. Hey, James, we have another top guest, General Russell Honoré, an honored retired commander who led a review of security failures following the mob assault on the Capitol January 6th. He worked with other military leaders, police chiefs, and experts. And, General, there's a lot to talk to you about, including what's going on uh, and back in Baton Rouge, where you are now. Uh, but first, I want to ask you, there have been charges uh, that Speaker Pelosi is to blame for the security failures on January 6th. No one look at this more more thoroughly than you. Uh, respond to that. Yeah, Speaker Pelosi and the, uh, the leader of the Senate have uh, executive responsibilities in their respective roles to make sure that the Capitol Police Board and the Capitol Police have the resources they need and they have the laws passed that empower them to do their job. But for the day-to-day -day operation of the Capitol security, that is the role of the Capitol Police. They take prominence inside their floor, as was the case when the Vice President was doing a roll call inside that room, the leader and the Sergeant at Arm, whether it's the House or the Senate, have uh, legal as well as force protection to protect the members inside that room. But the remainder of that capital remained under the control of the Capitol Police and the police board to make decisions on physical security around and in the Capitol. And they set the rules inside their chamber. Not that necessary. is why. But she is not solely responsible for security. That's a bumper sticker uh, that uh, had been passed out there. But on that day, equally responsible for executive was the leader of the Senate. They have equal responsibilities from the executive level to make sure they have what they need. General, once it occurred, and it was clear they were overwhelmed, the Pentagon dragged its feet in sending in reinforcements. Well, this is why we need to have a clear commission, because uh, the first casualty of war is the lies, is the truth. <laughs> As we say uh, in, uh, in the military, the first casualty of war is the truth. And uh, people have redefined what the truth is, and they really need to have that commission. What we looked at, sir, is what immediate fix need to be made. And in that regard, we recommended, and that rule has not been accepted yet, that the Capitol Police would be able to go straight to the Pentagon and ask for National Guard, as opposed to going through the Sergeant at Arms in the House and the Senate, which on that day, as of noon, or shortly after noon, they were under duress. So he couldn't talk to them. But that being said, you've heard on some testimony early on that was contradictory of each other of what role the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Army, and the Army staff in responding to the request from uh, the Capitol Police to respond. And there's a lot of room there that folks need to go on the record under sworn testimony, and that's what the committee would get after. But we looked at the command and control, and we found it to be very cumbersome of uh, what had been set up. Uh, and there are some other failures in intelligence, 
and responding to what they knew. They knew early that morning bombs had been planted around the Capitol. That should have turned some lights on. Yeah, sure should have. You you know, you looked at it all. This wasn't your main charge. But from what you saw, do you have any sense that some of those mob members were assisted by congressional staffers or even Capitol Police or members of Congress? Yes. I'm also of the opinion, personal opinion, not as a part of my report, but as a, uh, uh, an observer and a citizen, uh, that I think the executive branch was complicit in the attack. Well, you saw those four officers who testified before the Congressional Committee last week. Uh, what, what was your take on their testimony? I thought it was very rele- uh, revealing the amount of pain they felt, and that pain had been aggravated by each one of them speaking to the point that some people uh, in the Congress have tried to change the narrative from this being the all-out fight on the, to hold the line, fighting with citizens to try and protect the Capitol who did harm to the police. They attacked the police, even with sticks with American flags on the end of it, ripping off the equipment. And the problem we've got is they're sitting there telling this story and they're hearing congressional uh, members say, no, it was a picnic. They're hearing the former president say they, they were greeted with open arms and the doors were open for them and with a whole different narrative. They also, it, during then and afterwards, they were following that members of Congress, while they were testifying, was in front of the Supreme Court uh, during a news conference asking the Supreme Court and the Justice Department to release those who are being held, the mob, many of them white supremacists who are being held in federal jail to be released as political prisoners. If you were a police and you're still there today, what in the hell is going on in America? When you got elected officials trying to get the people who tried to overthrow the government and refer to them as political prisoners. When they attacked, they injured over 140 officers that day. They destroyed property, they stole property, and they tried to overthrow the government. And they're calling them political prisoners. And these are members of Congress. Wow. James? Yeah, well, uh, General, first of all, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. You're not just one of, you know, my favorite people in the world, and you're just such a, so proud to, to be from the same home state you are. I actually kind of have roots in the same parish, even. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, you, you famously said you can't fix stupid. All right? But I, I want to go to the situation in Louisiana, which we were talking about before. It's just catastrophic. And we have this problem with this this real idiot attorney general we have. It, it, what would you recommend to the governor that he do that's currently not being done? Or what do you? I mean, and I know he's trying hard. I think we both would would give him you know real real marks for, for effort in trying to bring the state together. But is there something that we can do uh, legally that can can try to get us out of this co- public health catastrophe we're in? I think uh, mandatory evacuation. He needs to challenge the board. He needs to order mandatory evacu- uh, uh, vaccination. Vaccination. Get on right. with it. Uh, uh, and, and the president needs to prepare the nation for mandatory evacuation. I, I tweeted this to the president two weeks ago, and finally they started to make some uh, action last week. But, James, the problem we're having go well beyond Landry. All through the COVID legislation last year, we had a legislature hell-bent on restricting the governor's power to respond to the COVID. When he was trying to uh, have mandatory masks, when he banned outdoor events, when he banned uh, large gatherings, the legislature were passing laws that he eventually had to veto. So we built this culture in a group of people in the majority party 
who were anti-vaccine, anti-mitigation, meaning masks, go outside. I mean, it is built for a year. They even came back in a veto session after this year's legislation to try to again go after the governor on the government powers that the governor has during an emergency to limit his powers to mandate mask wearing and to mandate uh, uh, shots. They passed a law that no state university or anyone or company could force people to wear a mask, I mean, to get a shot. So this has been the buildup we've had and that has uh, forced a lot of people to take political sides. And they're following the majority legislature in their hometowns, who many of them won't admit if they took the shot or not, Al. I mean, this is unbelievable. It is happening here right now. So I would say uh, we've got to press. One of the rules I dealt with when you're dealing with a disaster, because a disaster is not normal time, you got to figure out what rules you're going to break. Because the rules were made for normal time. He's got to figure out what damn rules he's going to break. And, and, and if people challenge his, let him go to court. In the meantime, he got to save people's lives. And not to, to put a, a anything else on it, uh, as you know, General Otteray is one of the experts on, on disaster management and everything. And the, the people at Colorado State, who are pretty good, say we're going to have a worse storm season than last year. And, you know, we had two major hurricanes hit Lake Charles. Yeah. And, and we're going to be in, the, in, in what appears to be the midst of a catastrophic uh, virus in addition to a, a very good chance, hopefully not, we'll have at least one mass evacuation, which is not going to be not going to make it very easy on anybody. Not to mention the strain on the healthcare system. Uh, so, I, you know, based on what you know, do you think the state is like prepared as well as it can be for the storm season? I, I think, from the perspective of having the National Guard and well-trained parishes that know what to do in terms of evacuation, yes. But the dynamics of this Delta is going to be a game changer because dealing with the first version of COVID, as we see, uh, was tough. This is going to be harder because it is so contagious. Uh, I think it's going to make it harder because even in that evacuation, we, we came up with new techniques. We had to put families in individual hotel rooms as opposed to using mass, um, survival and keeping them uh, in, uh, in in camps, like in gyms. We had to use hotels. So we had to evacuate people in New Orleans and North Louisiana and to Texas. We're not going to have the liberty of doing that because Texas now is in a heap of trouble with the COVID. I don't know where we're going to send people, I'll be honest with you. The big advice we're telling everybody is go get the shot. It's hurricane season. Uh, get past your cause. It's people with causes that causes like, I don't want to violate my freedom. I take it if I want to. No government is going to tell me what to do. The people with causes are the people that are ending up in the hospital and they're dying. They're the non-vaxxers. Not for medical reason or religious reason. It's cause. They're cause because they listen to this legislature and they listen to many people in Washington who did not encourage them to take the shot. Well, if I want to turn it over to Al, just make a point, I'm sure that this, this Dr. Catherine O'Neill, who runs the Lady of the Lake, seems like a highly competent person. And she went on television and says, everybody in this hospital is getting substandard care. Because it's not that these idiots are coming in and you're having a treat them. They're taking somebody else's bed. So if you might have a heart attack, you might be in an automobile accident. You, be, be, you know, a, a child fall out of a tree and break a leg. They're taking up all the space. It's not. It's not their right. If it was just them getting sick on their own, then who cares? They not only are they getting sick, they're transmitting the virus, and they're also occupying a, a hospital bed at 30 years old that should be available to people, to older people and sick people, and people that really need a, a quality of care. And when you have the chief medical officer of the state's largest hospital saying everybody in here is getting substandard care, that's a You'd think that would get people's attention, wouldn't you? Uh, you would hope so. But to those who bought into the cause, 
the uh, misinformation, uh, we've got a long ways to go. Our vaccination rates are really low, uh, under 40 percent. I think in New Orleans, they finally hit close to 50 percent. Uh, but we still have a long ways to go. We've got a lot of people that's going to get sick in the next couple of weeks because as many of them, James, are still running around without masks. Yeah. I'll tell you what, General. I'm up on the East Coast, and until the situation on the ground improves in Louisiana, I'm not going back. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I take backseat to nobody. I'm a bunch I love my state, but it, it's just too, it's just you know, the stupidity is just rampant. It's, it's, it's really discouraging. We... You know, we're talking about Lake Charles. The the congressman that represented Lake Charles, Clay Higgins, I'll mention his name. Right. Yeah. Last week, he introduced a bill uh, in the Congress. It will go nowhere. There's no way in hell the speaker will let that out of the out of the house. That would prevent any business from requiring people to wear a mask. Now, this is a guy that has done very little to help Lake Charles get the $3 billion they need to recover, which they have not gotten yet. He's all sponsoring a bill focused on telling businesses that they cannot prevent anyone from entering if they don't have a mask. This is, this is the ridiculous uh, situation we're in when we've allowed people of that caliber to get into the Congress. Well, well, he's also in a COVID ward at Lafayette General Hospital, all right? And just so you know how, how what kind of person he is, he's the only person in history to ever be sanctioned by the Annie Frank Museum, okay? I mean, you got to be you got to be pretty goddamn low to have the Annie Frank Museum. And he went to Auschwitz or something and compared wearing masks to the Holocaust or whatever, some oh, just stupid thing like go oh God. But yeah, he's really, thank you for mentioning his name because uh, Al Hunt and I have a thing is, you know, who's the worst of all these Republican congressmen? And I'll tell you, Clay, Clay Higgins is up there. He's, he, he's, He's in the hunt. I'll tell you that. He is. It's a very competitive contest, though. Uh, let me <laughs> let me ask the general: What can can the military, all military members, be required to be vaccinated? Yeah, we're right on the eve of making that happen. And that's going to happen because that's important. That's, that's an happen. important signal, isn't it? The uh, the Secretary of Defense had put the uh, what we call the military warning order out. Get ready. We're going to we're going to take the vaccine. Uh, when we went into Desert Storm, we took uh, antibodies at the port uh, that hadn't been fully uh, vetted. But the downside was you either take this antibody or the threat of Saddam using uh, anthrax on us was the, was, the, uh, was the threat. And we took the antibodies. We took the shots. And that damn bump stayed on my arm for, for years, but it, it never had any impact that I could tell. So the military will have to take this because this Delta is so uh, contagious. If it gets into a ship, the entire ship then becomes dysfunctional. We can't wait any longer with this second spike, if I may call it the second, because we had, we thought what we thought was bad. We got the shot, and now we have this spike. They don't have a choice. They have to do it. And the VA, the Veterans Administration, has ordered all their employees to take the shot. Yeah, three cheers for Dennis McDonough on that. You know, as James has pointed out, there's a long tradition here. General Washington at Valley Forge uh, required that his troops uh, be inoculated from smallpox. So the idea this is some kind of new big government mandate is just wrong. Uh, you see the anti-vaxxers said, nobody will tell me to take a shot. Well, hell, if you went to any school anywhere in America, you took right. at least six or seven shots. I mean, that's mandatory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course it is. Let me just get back to one or two questions on the January 6th um, and your report. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy said you want to turn the Capitol into a fortress. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hear that, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, and he and I talked about that one on one. Well, with my team. Hell Yeah. I mean, it's the biggest target in America, the U.S. Capitol, because uh, the, the, you can displace the president to about four different, five different locations. But if the Capitol stopped working, the democracy stopped working. 
you stop having laws, you stop getting funding. Uh, yeah, the capital is a target. That was hard for many members to come to grips with, even after they survived one six, that the capital is a target. It's a target to our adversaries, and now it's a bigger target for domestic terrorists who have shown that they are willing to organize, they've got the resource to do it, and they will attack the capital. Because when the capital stop running, government stop running. For the sacrifice of the Capitol Police and the D.C. Police, uh, we could have had a major disruption had they gotten to those boxes with the ballots in and burned them. Uh, I don't know what kind of mess we'd be in today if that had happened. And that's how close they came. General, Congress approved, I think it's a $2 billion emergency funding for the Capitol Police. Does that meet the challenges that you laid out in your report? It meets some of them. <laughs> it does not include that fencing we talked about. Right. We, we, we recommend that we brought the Corps engineers in and did some initial design to put fencing that would literally come out of the ground near the Capitol to give the Capitol Police some standoff. Those little fencing that the Capitol Police had out there, the bicycle racks, you might call them, uh, was reminiscent of a Roman army stacking uh, sticks up in front of them to break up a, a, a legion of people coming at them. I mean, we use medieval tactics to disrupt that formation because what you want to do is disrupt it so you can come out if you need to with non-lethal weapons and give people be able to break up the mass of people. The other dynamic they had going on that day, Albert, was the fact that the inauguration stands were in place. That's not a normal. Yeah, yeah. And that gave them access that they wouldn't normally have. But we found out most of the bottom floor windows on the Capitol are not uh, reinforced with nothing. You saw them break through with them in two before. But those things were built to couple uh, uh, set to 1400 and uh there's a lot of people in washington don't want to change the architectural integrity of the capital yeah i i would yeah. go ahead james uh, well the nation has changed challenged the architectural integrity of the capital didn't they <laughs> 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 so i guess but but I know that uh, Congressman Thompson is, is, you know, this committee, I think, is they got some good members. At the end of the day, do you think that they are, are going to find that they were collaborators within that building with these with these criminals? Because, you know, if, you, if I case the joint, I'm just as guilty as the trigger man. And, and do you think there's real possibility that there was help they had from within the building? I mean, I, think it, staff and staff. I don't think anyone will come into committee and admit it. They will call in likely people who they think that were collaborating, but I don't think they, they will admit it. They'll, they'll pee some forth. What I don't know is, did the FBI capture the metadata of who was talking to who? Because we right. have that, that information should be available. When you and I go through an airport, if we mention the word president or some use a bad word about somebody in the government, those big computers are picking that up. So right. did they capture the metadata? Who was talking to who? Right. Well, I hope they. If they did, did they keep it or did they flush it? And there would be a, a uh, sub, suspect complicit move if the FBI scrubbed that data. Right. Well, uh, General, you've been uh, enormously generous with your time, and I'll turn it back to Al for the last question, but to tell you just what an honor it is to have you on here and the amount of pride you bring to our home state and the whole United States of America. We're very fortunate uh, to have you in this position. Uh, so uh, thank you, sir, and Albert, I'll, I'll let you end it. Well, I, I want to second everything James just said. We're honored to have you in the guest as a guest, and you, and you did a tremendous service, as you have for many years, to your country in leading that January 6th uh, report. Um, how prepared are we if the terrorists come back again in two, three months to the Capitol, General? Well, uh, they made many changes uh, as we were departing. To uh, They did, did some training. They bought some new equipment. Uh, they've improved the command and control. And we have a new sergeant-at-arms in the House and the Senate. 
So uh, from what I can tell, uh, the training they're doing, the equipment they bought, uh, they are better prepared. But it does not meet the scenario of what happened at 3 o'clock in the morning. Attack. We always want to fight the last war. But the next war might be different. And that's why uh, we recommended, Albert, that they put two National Guard MP companies at the Armory in D.C. to be prepared to protect our nation's capital. Uh, Senator Leahy didn't like that idea. So that did not get approved, nor was it funded. At the same time, after 9-11, we kept 250 National Guardsmen at the Capitol for over two years. They don't want to repeat that. So I don't know why the Republicans don't want to support those type of activities. That did leave in the bill from the House about the quick reactive force. On the other hand, if I may, after 9-11, we put 21 F-15s, James, at Andrews Air Force Base because the Capitol had been attacked. And they're still there with 600 Air National Guardsmen, with two of them at any given time with pilots sitting in the seat in case somebody's flying through Washington, toward Washington, and many hours of the day they're flying a cap over Washington. On the other hand, we put a National Guard Air Defense Unit in Washington, D.C. You don't see them, you shouldn't see them. But they're there after needed. But they would not buy into that ground quick reaction force uh, at the D.C. Armory. And uh, I hope we don't come to regret that because Leahy is, well, we can get local police. Well, go look at any local police in that area and how many officers are on duty at 3 o'clock in the morning. About 10 to 15% of their forces because all the drunks are going home and they go to a minimum manning. So uh, I think we're still vulnerable. The Capitol is still a target, but I've got the faith in the Capitol Police. They've cleaned up a lot of procedures in their command and control, and I think the Capitol is secure. But it's not secure, Albert. Uh, for public entrance. They're going to have to hire more police to be able to deal. Back in the day when you and I first laid eyes on the Capitol and we strolled around and had picnics on the lawn, that will be long before that happened because they need to add more police and they need to add more security entrances to be able to deal with that, sir. Well, I regret that, but it's absolutely essential. You are right. And I, again, I want to reiterate what James said. We are so honored to have you on this program and, and thank you for your service for the January 6th Commission and for many, many decades before that. Thank you, and no, be, no, be, be safe down there with that crazy attorney general, okay? <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. trying to stay across the street from that guy. All right, darling. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank but you. I tell you what, James. Yes, sir. If you for run for governor, if they're serious to put him up, you and I are going to have to talk. No, absolutely. Because as long as the Republicans keep no. putting stupid people up, we can beat no. them. Last time they put Vita, if they put that guy up, he can be beat. And you now have to talk. We will do anything. We'll I, put a hand weapon on him. He won't forget. Uh, I've just Corporal Carville reporting for duty, sir. Whatever it takes. I'm, Man, I'm, I'm, I'm there. If, if, I'm it, there. if there's an honorary Carville movement here, you yeah. know, man, I'm betting on it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. There's a, a large military army installation in Louisiana called Fort Polk. It's very famous. It's named after a particularly incompetent Confederate general. And I really, and I said on, on Brian Williams, I mean this, why don't, we, why don't we call it Fort Honoré and have a particularly <laughs> competent patriotic general that actually is for the United States? That would be a good idea, I think. <laughs> well, we've got, for the United States. we've got four more worthy than I, sir. I doubt that. But again, right. General, thank you so much. Yes, no, have a good thank day. You. you bet. Hey, this episode is brought to you by Rise, a science-based app to improve sleep and your daily energy. And nothing's more important, as we agree, James, than a good night of rest. It's not normal to feel tired all day. That means you're carrying sleep debt. It limits your energy peaks and it, making your dips less productive. And when you combine great mattress technology or your favorite bed with an app designed to maximize your rest, you can take on the world. Have you ever had trouble getting the rest you need, James? Yeah, a lot. And, these, and this is the kind of stuff that, you know, that science to the rescue. It, it, it's the sleep equivalent of the vaccines, okay? Yeah, it sure does. Uh, I mean, this is the answer. The Rise app we've been waking up ready to take on every day. 
Like us, you can become a morning person. You know, I didn't think I'd ever become a morning person. Then I found Rise App, all without ditching your phone, buying supplements, a mattress, or a weighted blanket. Rise uses a scientific, fact-based approach to help you get the rest you need with cutting-edge sleep research. Rise works by pulling historical data from your phone to tell you your sleep needs and tracks how much sleep you still owe your body. Then it shows you your daily energy schedule and shows you the techniques to pay it back so you can make the most of your day. It helps me go to bed when my energy drops and get started on my work when I'm at my peak. Every morning, Rise tells you how long you'll be groggy, when your peak focus times will be, and when to start winding down for better sleep and more energy. Rise helps you realize your potential with real results. Go to risescience.com slash warroom and download the Rise app today to try it free for seven days. Most Rise users feel the benefits in just five. So try it today to learn more about your sleep and energy levels, plus feel better all for free during the trial. Whether you want to become a morning person, be less exhausted during the day, or improve your productivity and daily energy, Rise is the power behind your next best day. That's risescience.com slash warroom to try the Rise app free for seven days. Yeah, you know, it, it, how I feel is, you know, if I get eight, that's great, okay? And, and this helps me get to that goal, man. That, you know, eight is great. And use this app, then you can achieve one of the great things in life, and that is a good night's sleep. And it's great for any age, but uh, for, for us geezers, it's even better, James. Okay, James, once again, our listeners have come through this week. We've got some great questions. I want to start with Philip from Alachua, Florida. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He says, I grew up at a farm. I have a degree in supply chain management. I run a weekend small business and work a day job for our local school board. Why can't Democrats go on the offensive? I swear, I felt like I've been on the defense my whole adult life. I'm 35. We should be kicking their ass with back-to-back -back failed Republican administrations. Why aren't we doing better? Uh, boy, that guy's really smart. He makes a, a, a very cogent observation. And particularly in Florida, where, you know, we talked about this, DeSantis has been on the offense the whole time. I think it's all collapsing. And, you know, I think we have a much better shot. I think Val Demings has got, you know, very gutsy. I think she's going to uh, – I think she can beat Rubio, but she definitely going to have been in the fight. And, you know, living in Florida, it's been such a t tough go for the Democrats, and I think uh, unnecessarily so. And so hopefully you can inspire Democrats in that part of the world to, to you know, step up and move forward. But the observation is very well taken. Yeah, it sure is. And uh, you have to have to have them address the right questions, which they haven't always been being the Democrats in the past. But if they get a good if they get a good good material candidate to run with Demings, uh, James is right. Uh, you know, it may turn things around. Kevin in Sacramento, California, asked, he said, I thought conservatives believed in more local control rather than less. You know, that body that's closest to the people governs the best, right? Local school boards deciding what's best for their kids. But what are these guys doing all over the country? Uh, we mentioned earlier the uh, attorney general in Louisiana threatening to remove funding from counties and schools if they try to protect people with masks. This is rank hypocrisy, Kevin. It's unbelievable. The other thing, when I started covering politics, an absolutely central tenet of the Republican philosophy was let, private, let the private sector make decisions except in extreme cases. <clears throat> Governor DeSantis says the cruise companies don't have any right to make the decision. They're a private company. Let's let big government step in and make a decision. It is hypocrisy beyond description, and they ought to be called out for it. Well, I think they get called out for it. Their voters don't care. I mean, you got people that demand to be lied to, and they don't care. I mean, the, the hypocrisy is just, it's, it's breathtaking. But it, 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 we assume that it is, and it, all it is is just feed this monster <clears throat> that is out there. And they don't care if you tell the truth or not. I mean, how many times they had Trump lied? They got the, the Toronto Star, the Washington Post, and 22,480 or something like that. And it, it, just a sad truth of modern American life is a large swath of people in the United States demand to be lied to. 
Well, <clears throat> here's Noah in Lugoff, South Carolina, who's going to draw on Carville's encyclopedic uh, knowledge you got of me there. politics almost everywhere. He's a college student at the University of South oh, Carolina. Right. Uh, he's studying political right. science. He's also someone that works on campaigns down there. Right. But his question is this, James. He says, Democrats have made gains in Georgia and North Carolina over the past 20 years. And most of that, how much of it at least has to do with population growth in areas like Atlanta and Charlotte and the Research Triangle in North Carolina. South Carolina, we see growth in similar areas. You look at Greenville, mm -hmm. I'm, I know that's the case. I've been right. there and around Columbus too. But when can we expect Democrats to become more competitive? Uh, and what can we do to encourage business and transplants to move here? Right. Well, uh, good point. I thought we would, I was disappointed in 2020. I didn't think we were going to win necessarily. But I, I kind of think that South Carolina is, you know, more on the track of Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia than on the track of Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee. But uh, I, having said that, I, I was disappointed by more than a little bit by election night in South Carolina. I, I thought we'd move, become closer to where North Carolina is and less where Alabama is, but I don't know. It, it, it's troubling because they do it. it South Carolina grows. There's a lot of a lot of in migration there, and particularly in the coastal areas. So let, let's see. It, it, it might not, it might but be as grim as it looks. That's all I can. That's about as optimistic as I can be. Well, James, you're right about the coastal areas, but also yes, Greenville. Greenville's right. That's I mean, a Greenville, great town too. It's a totally yeah. different and town. And that's than it was and suburban years ago. Charlotte. You know, it, yes, it is. I've been right. to Greenville right. a couple of times, and I've, I've been impressed every time I go there. One of the great minor league ballparks in America, a replica of Fenway yeah, Park, yeah. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a it's a vibrant uh, it's a vibrant town. So Noah, hang in there, keep working. Uh, it may take a little while, but it's going to happen. Here, James Dolores in San Francisco via Nashua, New Hampshire. I spent a lot of time in both yeah. those towns. They couldn't be more different, but I really like both of them. They are really good places. Dolores wants to know, is there an honest and concerted way to cover politics without it constantly orbiting around our previous president? My husband announces all of CNN's breaking news and outrages. I implore him, stop. I wait for the PBS NewsHour oh. to decipher what is true news and look forward to James Carville to get good and spinning mad to help me vent my angus. I'll just say to you, Dolores, if you count on the NewsHour for your news and James <clears throat> to vent your angst, you are in, you are in clover. Uh, you couldn't do uh, any better. <laughs> I don't know about me, but I do know the NewsHour is the best, best journalism that's on television anyway. And I don't think it's really close. And I mean, it's been, uh, there, it's been there forever. So uh, you, have, you have excellent taste. Uh, I don't know about me, but you sure got excellent taste comes to news hour. But you're right. And they just, you know, thank God there's still some people in this country that are interested in facts and interested in knowing what's going on. But it's, it's diminishing, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. But Dolores, keep watching the news hour and keep listening and uh, keep watching James. Greg, in Friendship, New York, says the Lincoln Project and other activist groups are going after corporate donors for their support of the insurrection candidates in the Republican Party. You know, he says, I support these efforts, but is it really effective? Are there back doors for these corporations to donate that may be more opaque or completely invisible? Can these efforts really have an impact? Well, you know, right after it happened, you had a lot of posturing and of great Americanism. And, of course, it's all dissipated. And the truth of the matter is these corporations are going to do everything they, they can and to protect and, and advance their interests, be it in any state capital or the federal government. And if it means they got to donate to insurrectionists or people that are soft on, on sedition, so be it. They'll do it. And I, it can't be effective, but it's in, there's a thousand ways they can do it. Individual people can as Wherever there's a way, they're going to figure a way to, to donate to these people. I promise you. Hey, Greg, let me give you a site that you may want to go to or a place you may want to subscribe to. It's called Popular Information with Judd Legum. He follows this more closely than anyone. <clears throat> Peace out today. General Motors, six months ago, said we are all for voting rights. It's a precious right. No one should interfere with the right to vote. At the same time, they were contributing $125,000 to the Republican State Legislative Council, which is a leader in the voter suppression efforts. 
And I don't know whether the pressure works or not, but I want to expose them. I want General Motors to have to explain how they can give 125 grand to a voter suppression group and at the same time say, we consider the right to vote precious. So it's called popular information. Jed Legum, I think James agrees. Really that, that guy's been good for a long time. Yes, it's Yeah, he yeah. really is. James Frank in Victoria, British Columbia. I love our Canadian listeners. He said, why don't the Democrats have a better answer to the charge of being socialist than I'm not a socialist? As a Canadian, I can tell you we're generally quite happy with our state-run health care and other parts of social safety net. We also have freedom of speech, assembly, religion, independent courts, and all the other things that go along with an advanced democracy. He notes his girlfriend is from Cuba, and they have socialized medicine and everything, but it's a totally different society. It is, it is, it is authoritarian, totalitarian leadership. Why don't Democrats draw the distinction? Well, Frank, you're right. I mean, I don't think there a lot of these people running against socialists aren't running against Medicare. They aren't running against veterans' health care benefits. Uh, and uh, Democrats have to answer that more forcefully. The idea that expand the Affordable Health Care Act is socialism is nonsense. It relies on the private sector. It requires some changes. It requires some regulations. But uh, um, America is so far from being a socialist country uh, and and it's just it's political pablum that they're political crap that the other side's put. Right, I, ahead, except what I, I I would say when the, the charge of my associates. Let me tell you what I am. I I I invest in the stock of ten different American companies, and I fully support Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. What does that make me? You got a issue? You got a problem with any of that? Let me know. Speak up, and then you can define it the way that you want. I, I mean, I, I think those kind of short, hard-hitting answers is, yeah, okay, you're right. I own stock, and I believe in a, in a robust social safety net. What is that? You, you described that. I, I would say it's a good description of common freaking sense. A real American, I yeah. would say. Um, James, we got a couple uh, recommendations and comments coming in about our Ivy League oh. Sphincter Hall oh, of Fames. Hey. Uh Peter in Westport wants to nominate John Bolton, who knew full well what Donald Trump was doing to this country and waited till his book came out so he could make money off it. Uh, and Jason in Des Moines, Iowa, nominates Rob Porter, the White House Staff Secretary under Trump, uh, who, uh, who Jason notes hit on both of his wives. Uh, so, I, you know, I think, I think we can put him on the list for consideration. Yeah. I do. I, I, the, the problem yeah. is, is that the, this, there's so many and the standards are so high. You know, you can be an awfully good, you know, baseball player and not be in the Hall of Fame. It, that's possible. Right. Yeah. Speaking of, by the way, just as an aside, you see Max Scherz, I was happy for him last night. Oh, God. My favorite baseball player maybe of all times. Yeah. You know, he and Henry Aaron. Uh, I'll tell you, and what a competitor. What a competitor. And, and I'll tell you, I was sick when he left. I understand why. I don't criticize that at all. I criticize the Trey Turner move on the Nationals. But Max Scherzer was here for seven years, and he gave us more thrills than almost any baseball player I can imagine during those seven years. He sure games. did. What, what a, a game. What a, what, a, what, a, what a pitcher. What a right? game. He is. Okay, keep those recommendations and questions coming in. We love this segment. Hey, James, we know elections are decided around the kitchen table. But when it comes to our house and your house, Magic Spoon cereal is the clear winner. And, and James, at any age, our age or our kid's age or my grandson's age, you won't be able to get enough of our favorite snack breakfast and all-around delicious treat, Magic Spoon cereal. Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four grams of carbs in each serving. It's only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. And you can build your own box or get a variety pack with available flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, which I happen to love, blueberry, which my grandson Kai loves, and cinnamon. And I've got some great news, James. You'll love this. Magic Spoon is bringing back two super popular flavors, cookies and cream and maple waffle permanently. It's delicious, indulgent, and healthy. Right, James? Correct. It tastes really good, and this is the point I make. I use it, it's, it, it, it's not just for breakfast, it's a very good snack food. 
you know, if you're sitting there on your computer, it, it, as opposed to like just putting M&Ms in your mouth, which is you know not particularly good for you, this stuff is very helpful and very satisfying, very tasty. So I, I, I like to leave a little in the bowl next to my chair and I, you know, watch sports and, you know, look at the computer and talk on the phone. So it's great stuff. I, I couldn't recommend it more, but it's, not, it's more than a breakfast food. It is great stuff. So go to magicspoon.com slash warroom to grab this delicious cereal and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code warroom at checkout to save $5 off your order. Okay, and now for our outrage of the week. You know, James, I, I don't really have a lot of interest in talking about Fox News' Tucker Carlson and his white nationalist rants. But this week he took his show to Hungary and celebrated its prime minister, Viktor Orban. Let's just toss out a few facts about the Hungarian strongman. He has trafficked in anti-Semitic code words. He has curbed an independent judiciary. He is distorting the electoral process there. He is viciously anti-LGBTQ. He wants to fill the educational institutions with right-wing propaganda. But most relevant uh, for this, these purposes is Orban's contempt for a free press. In Orban's Hungary, a reporter can be jailed for, ga- for conveying fake news. Sound like a familiar phrase, James? I believe Mr. Carlson has every First Amendment right in this country to peddle what I consider demagogic diatribes every night. But if he were practicing in an Orban-style government, the one that he says should be a showcase for democracy and civilization, if he were practicing there and said something they didn't like, you know what, that'd be the end of his career. Put simply, Viktor Orban is an autocratic thug. Well, everything you say is true. I, my outrage is the stupid people that don't get vaccinated. And if you're so into this, why don't you sign a statement that you'll forego any medical care as a result of COVID because you think it's fake. And this is getting to be, it's not, they're a public health menace and they're taking, you know, now hospitals can't do elective procedures, can't even treat emergencies or anything else. And these people are just goddamn stupid. You're just stupid. And I know that a lot of you, a lot of listeners, a lot of us know people like that. I've just had it with them. I've just had it. It's just, it's, it's stupidity. And the points that they make in support of it are even stupider than, than you think. And, you know, as we pointed out with General Honor, if if good enough for George Washington and the Continental Army, then it's good enough for us. Yeah, absolutely. You remember a year ago, we had a great guest on, Joanne Lippman, who had done a big piece on how the COVID problem was going to crowd out a lot of people who needed heart surgery, cancer treatment, and a lot of other ailments. And we thought we were over that. We're not. I mean, look in your home state, and it's coming back. These selfish bastards uh, deserve to be be called out because they're stupid, and they're selfish, and they're harmful. And some of these business people, a lot of them are Republicans. These people are not doing you any favor. And and some of them are starting to get mad, too. It's like, okay, we've had enough of this crap. Let's, Let's get going here. And it, it's it's awful. It, it, these people are a they're a public health threat to the United States. It, it should be yeah. It should be treated like they were Japanese spies. Yeah, totally. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we would really appreciate it if you'd check out the link to our sponsors, Chili Sleep, Rise, and Magic Spoon. We thank you for supporting them. When you do, it helps make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning.